Good morning. I hope your holiday weekend is going well. Hope you're well and safe. This morning we're going to take a look at a New Testament character who's a very important one. But I mentioned yesterday that there's not a book written about him. He didn't write anything and he wasn't one of the disciples. And he plays a very key role. So the question is, what was that role? What was his message? What was his function? Did he accomplish what he set out to do? Was he confused at some points? As a matter of fact, one final thing before uh, Joe and Joey bring us a song. Jesus said of him, no one born of a woman was greater than him. We'll be back in a minute.
Let's pause for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, we live in extraordinary times. We know that. And the Bible character we're going to look at today also lived in extraordinary times. And he was ushering in some incredible change. Even he didn't understand it. Perhaps we don't understand everything that we're going through today. But we offer ourselves to you. The most important thing that we can do is offer ourselves to you that we might be used for your purposes, for your glory, and that you might shine through us the same way you did through John the Baptist. Speak through these words that I'm going to share now. I pray it for your kingdom's sake. Amen. John the Baptist, he was the forerunner. He's the one who went before Jesus. They probably knew each other since they were little boys because their moms were relatives and apparently quite close. And I could go into the biblical background as to why that was, but undoubtedly they knew each other growing up. But at some point, John got this call in his life that he was to, to make the way for Jesus. And it was revealed to him that Jesus was the Messiah. The problem, if there's a problem, was that they didn't really know what to expect of the Messiah. They expected a Messiah was going to come and he was going to change everything, which meant the Romans were going to be out. And it was going to be going back to like the days of David and Solomon, where, where Israel was powerful and gold and silver, and, and they weren't run down by their enemies. They didn't know exactly how it was going to happen, but they knew that it was going to be a righteous kind of thing. It wasn't just going to be some, some bloodbath or something. I've heard it put this way. There's all these prophecies about the Messiah in the Old Testament. And they all refer to the same Messiah, but two comings. Jesus in his first coming wasn't what people expected him to be. He wasn't what John the Baptist expected him to be. And we're going to talk a little bit about that this morning and hopefully shed some light on that. So... The idea of the Messiah coming meant cataclysmic change. So if, if John the Baptist was the Elijah that was prophesied about, and even at times he didn't understand it fully, well, then it meant the world as they knew it was about to change radically. We live in a time like that, I believe, that so much has happened this year that we don't know exactly how everything's going to shake out. How many of you remember Y2K? Some of you may not remember Y2K because you were young. But we thought that that was going to change everything. People are writing songs about it. Uh, Sting wrote a song, Brand New Day, Turn the Clock to Zero. We're starting everything all over again. You know, that's not a bad idea. See, when we think it's the end of the world, then we start thinking, well, maybe, maybe I ought to change. Maybe I ought to take a closer look at me. Not just how can the world out there change and make me happier. How can I take account of my life and say to God, God, what do, you, what do you expect from me? I'll always remember the night that my brother Rick came home from college. It wasn't the end of the semester. And he just, he just reached a point where he came home. The cataclysmic change was happening in his life. I'll never forget, sat down in our room at our desk that we had both worked at for years. And he was going through, looking through old files and stuff. And he said something to me. He said, Paul, I just want to start my life all over again. My brother Rick did. The guy that you know, no, that's not the guy that, that I knew growing up. The guy that's a pastor over at Christ Church, no. The, I know a different guy. You can start things over, and I think that that was some of the, the sense that they had. But if John was the Elijah, that meant that huge change was coming and was possible. So, who was John? Well, he was a tough preacher. I've never patterned my preaching after him. Some of you are like, what do you mean you didn't? He's a biblical character. No one... No one greater than him was ever born of a woman, said Jesus. Well, uh, I prefer to be more of a Barnabas, more of an encourager. That's, that's kind of my goal. John the Baptist, oh, he was a wrecking ball. So, like, one of his opening lines is he refers to the congregation as, not a congregation, but it's a bunch of people who are listening out there by the Jordan River. He calls them a brood of snakes. Okay, West Hills family, can you imagine we're back, Hopefully, July 19th, everything goes as planned. We're back. And I look off to the left side and I say, you guys are a brood of snakes. On the left side. On the right side, you, you guys are you know, maybe more like toads or something like that. I don't think we'd have any issues with uh, attendance. I think attendance would go down. He was a wrecking ball. He was brutally honest in, in how he spoke. But it brought about an, an honest response from people. People... Man, they, 
they responded to him. They flocked down to the Jordan River, and we're going to talk about the location. But his message cut them to the heart, and so they asked in Luke chapter 3, verse 10, what should we do if, if the end of the world is coming, if the Messiah is coming, whatever that means? And they didn't know. What do we do? So there was three groups of people, it says. So the crowds asked, what should we do? John replied, if you have two shirts, give one to the poor. If you have food, share it with those who are hungry. Now, I thought it was very interesting. I got a letter this week, and there's someone from our church family who lives a little bit further away and um, has been tuning in, but not on Facebook. So I can't see it. I, I, I suppose there's some metrics I could look at from, from, um, uh, from YouTube, but that's where she's been watching. And she goes back to the very first message that I preached online. And it was the one where I talked about toilet paper, about sharing that. And she said that her mom was telling you, you've got to stay in, you've got to stay safe. But I talked about if you can help people, we should. We should prayerfully consider helping people that need something and sharing. Well, she had a friend who's going through a really rough time. And so she and her son went and took some furniture to this new apartment that she was moving into because she had to. And they brought food to her. And I just found that out, just found it out this week that that's what Jesus compels us to do. He compels us to do something. John the Baptist was saying, love your neighbor as yourself. That's what he was communicating. So it also says that even tax, even corrupt tax collectors, not the good ones, the bad ones, came to be baptized and asked, teacher, what should we do? And he said, collect no more taxes than the government requires. Tax collectors were notorious for charging too much. Why? Because they could. They'd get away with it. And the Romans would back them up. They were not well liked. But even these people recognized there was something that wasn't quite right in their life. And then some soldiers came and asked, what should we do? John said, don't extort money or make false accusations and be content with your pay. These are three common groups of people. None of these people were rich. And yet, what's the one thing that all three responses have in common? They all have to do with giving of our material possessions to other people or not taking from others what doesn't belong to us. That's amazing. There's a word for that. He's addressing greed. Now, when I think of the first century and these guys cruising around with their sandals on and their tunics, and I don't know how many of them had 401ks, I'm thinking not a single person in this crowd. And John the Baptist is confronting greed in their lives. What would John the Baptist say to us today? I don't think he would say what Gordon Gecko said in Wall Street. Greed is good. No, greed is something that, that distorts. Greed is something that can take over. And so just an opening word that is just as relevant, maybe more so today than it was then, is that don't let greed control your life. Jesus says your life does not exist. It consists of the abundance of your possessions. We can get to the point where our possessions possess us. And we're not really free until we're free enough to give things away. But that's a sermon for another day. Let's move on in the passage. In Matthew chapter 3, we find out that Jesus went down to the Jordan to be baptized. Now you might ask the question, why would Jesus need to be baptized? This was a baptism for the repentance of sins. And repentance gets a bad rap. All it means is I'm turning. I was going that way, now I'm going to go this way. I was going the wrong way, now I'm going to go the right way. Jesus didn't need to do that. We're going to come back to that because I think it's a very good question. But folks were walking 10, 12, 15, 20 miles one way down to the Jordan River. What would you walk that far for? Oh, on a hiking trip, yeah, I'll, I'll hike because it's beautiful. But would I do that to go hear some itinerant preacher who ate locusts? He would be really happy. John the Baptist ate locusts, so he'd be really happy this year, wouldn't he? He wouldn't be starving. There's cicadas galore. Why did they do it? They were hungry for change in their personal lives. Do you notice that John the Baptist didn't go to Jerusalem? He could have found some water there. He could have found some water to baptize people. But no, he went to the Jordan River, not too far from Jericho. Historically, what does that represent? That's the spot where Joshua led the Israelites through the Jordan River into the Promised Land. That was the gateway to the Promised Land. So, what does that mean symbolically? It means John the Baptist, no doubt, chose that spot on purpose. 
He's saying this is the gateway into the promised land. There is a new life that's ahead for us. There is something better that's waiting around the corner. Incredible significance to the spot that he chose. Something that would give people hope of a better world. How are you doing for hope today? How are you doing in your heart that tomorrow is going to be better than today? Or maybe if tomorrow is worse, that 2021 will be better. 2025 will be better. And is our hope ultimately in eternity? You know, sometimes Christians can be accused of bad faith. In other words, we let things go here and, and don't care too much here because we just got pie in the sky. It's not one or the other. But folks, don't, don't give up on that hope that one day things are really going to be right. But this is this gateway into, um, into the promised land, which I think is so cool, so symbolic. I learned that from Adam Hamilton. When they were dunked, immersed in the water, it was a symbol that their sins were being cleansed away that their past was behind them. If you left your past behind you, if, if they could do it with John the Baptist, we can certainly do it as new covenant followers of Jesus. Do you let yesterday eat too much of today up? Don't. Leave it behind you. God's not worried about yesterday. He's the God of now and he's the God of the future. Do not let your past mess up today nor your future. That, that is not pleasing to God. He doesn't want that for you. So, Something that, that's also very significant is that the Jordan River flows down into the Dead Sea. I believe the Dead Sea is the lowest uh, uh, body of water in the world. Could be wrong on that. It's not that imperative. But nothing lives in the Dead Sea. Nothing lives in... That's why they call it the Dead Sea. So if you got your sins cleansed away in, in the Jordan River, if your sins went into that water, symbolically they went down into the Dead Sea where nothing lives. They're dead. And that's how we can look at, at our transgressions, our shortcomings, our addictions, whatever you want to look at, it, however you want to call it. It's dead. It's done. It's past. And even with John the Baptist, they were, they were getting this message. I love what it says. Even the Old Covenant says it in Psalm 103, verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far does God remove our transgressions from us. I mean, the east and west, they, they don't meet. They go in opposite directions. That is good news, even good news in the days of the Old Covenant. These folks were, were desperate for change. Soldiers, tax collectors, common folks. I like a certain song by Garth Brooks, Friends in Low Places. John the Baptist had friends in low places. It doesn't say anything here about famous people coming out there, other than Jesus, but Jesus... He also had friends in low places, and we're going to look more at that in the weeks to come. What would you do for change? These folks walked a long way. They probably didn't have a Motel 6 to stay at. I don't know. I don't know. Like I, I'm intrigued a lot about how these people got around. You know, sometimes we, we get desperate. We see something and you say, I'm going to do whatever it takes. I'll always remember it was, it was September uh, 10th, 2001, the day before the infamous 9-11. And I visited a young man at, at St. Joseph's Hospital in, in Lincoln Park. He had come to Christ on Easter the year before in springtime at the Apollo Theater. I'd gotten together with him multiple times. He went home for the summer. And when he came back to school at DePaul, he went in for a, a physical. And they found something was, was very wrong. I was there at the hospital the day that they told him that he had a brain tumor. And I will always remember leaving the room and after having prayed with the family, praying for healing, but also for strength and for courage. Right before this doctor, this woman exited the elevator, she turned and looked at me and she said, it was good that you prayed the way you did because that family is going to need courage and they will need strength because this story will not end well. I will never forget the walk back home to my condo. I'll always remember saying to my wife, I will pray, I will fast, I do not want to do John's funeral. And John was tough, and he survived three years, but I preached his, his funeral. But not before I baptized him in Lake Michigan, and not before I baptized his wonderful mom, Chris, in Lake Michigan. Sometimes we're desperate, and sometimes we don't get the result that we want. But there were good things that came even through that, that tragedy. John the Baptist thought he was going to be doing something, I think, even bigger than what he was doing. And as soon as Jesus came on the scene, he's like, I must 
decrease and he must increase. And isn't that a great thing for us? That even in our own lives we say, hey, it's not about me, it's about him. It's his story, it's his world, he's letting me live in it. And I think that John got that. But then John did some preaching and that preaching got him thrown in prison. And John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus, he, he understood, so I got to be less while Jesus becomes more. But I'm rotting in a prison cell. And so he sends a messenger. He sends a messenger to Jesus with this question. Are you the one to come or should we expect somebody else? He's already told people that he's the Lamb of God. He's already claimed that Jesus is the Messiah. But you know, sometimes our personal circumstances are so difficult that it really, it really messes with our faith. We Doubt comes in. And some of it's our expectations. John had expectations that the world was never going to be the same again. It was hard. It was hard even for Jesus to respond. Have you ever been disappointed with God? You don't, you don't have to answer to me, but in the quietness of your own heart, you know whether you have or not. Let God speak to that disappointment. Be honest with him. He can deal with it. So Jesus says, I want you to send this message back because he sent some of his disciples to Jesus. He said, tell John this, that, that the blind, they can see, the lame can walk, the deaf can hear, the dead are coming back to life. Yeah, tell him that. And in my mind's eye, the messengers are turning away and then Jesus says, and one more thing, blessed is he who doesn't fall away on account of me. In other words, blessed, happy is the person that isn't disappointed in me. What was he saying? He's saying, John, I know I'm not what you expected. And this isn't what you deserve because you are a good and a great man. It's sad. And in a few days, John the Baptist was beheaded. And it's not in my notes for today, but... When that happened, Jesus stole away by himself to pray. He had to get away from the crowds. He had to get away from the people. It broke his heart because he knew how wrong and how broken this world is that a good man gets executed by bad men. That is a bad deal. And that bothered Jesus. But I loved how he came out of it. He bumps into this crowd of people and he's like, okay, we're, I'm going to talk. It says, moved by compassion. Jesus gets the world that you and I live in, where wrong things happen. It broke his heart then, it breaks his heart now. How did he respond? With compassion. That was one of the times that the disciples came to Jesus, you got this big crowd here, and it's really cool that you're compassionate and they love your words, but they're hungry and they got nothing to eat. You got to break up the party. And he basically said, no, why don't you feed them? And they had a party right there. Jesus responded with compassion. I think being a human being, having a friend, a cousin perhaps, die in a situation like that, it was so wrong. He gets our brokenness. He gets the stuff that we go through. You know, Jesus still gets today that sometimes he's not what we expect him to be. You might have seen this in the media, and I looked it up the other day, and I don't want to give the name of the t-shirt company that sells it, but there's a t-shirt out there that says that if Jesus came back, we'd kill him again. I don't know how it makes you feel when you hear those words, but that didn't go over really well with me. But what really surprises me is that people don't understand that the Christian faith does believe that Jesus is coming back. He's not coming back with a crown of thorns, my friends. He's coming back as the king. He's coming back as what John the Baptist expected him to be in the first place. He's coming back what Peter, James, and John expected him to be in the first place. God decided to give love a chance for at least 2,000 years. But there will be a point. See, some people come up with this false syllogism that God can't be good and be powerful because if he was both, there would be no evil. The one thing that they don't factor in is eternity. And if you've read the end of the book as I have, you know that God will end evil. It will come to an end when Jesus comes back and is exactly what John the Baptist expected him to be. And he will usher us in to the promised land. And there will be no more weeping. There will be no more pain. There, actually, there will be weeping and he'll wipe the tears away from our eyes. 
I couldn't help but think about that, that the Prince of Peace will come back. Folks, no one's going to have the opportunity to kill Jesus again. He laid down his life. And when he comes back, he will change everything forever. He's given love a chance for almost 2,000 years for us to simply respond because we wanted to. Someday, that opportunity will end. Jesus' baptism, let's get back to that. And this is the closest we've been to the end of the message yet. Just want to encourage you with that. Why was Jesus baptized? John actually said, no, you should baptize me. He totally got it. It's like, Jesus, you baptize me. Jesus says, no. He said something to the effect that we want to fulfill all righteousness. Adam Hamilton helped me with this. Why did Jesus do that? That is beautiful. It's poetry. See, what Adam said is that in his church, Church of the Resurrection, they have, a, um, they have all sorts of recovery groups. And, you know, sometimes people, uh, it's hard to go to a recovery group because you're kind of outing yourself. They have a recovery group for sex addicts. And he said that Jesus stepping into the water and being baptized for the remission of sin, without saying a word, without saying, oh yeah, you're right, you're, you're right, John the Baptist, I am better than you are and better than all of these sinners, so why don't I baptize you? No, Jesus said, you go ahead and baptize me. I'm getting in the tank with you. I'm immersing myself with all of you. I am identifying with all of my friends in low places. What Adam Hamilton said is, it would be like someone in his church going with another friend who was too scared to go to the sex addicts recovery group and just says, look, I know you don't want to go. It's difficult. I'll go with you. But they didn't go with the t-shirt that says, I'm not one of you. They wouldn't go with the t-shirt and say, I am not an addict. They just went and they loved their friend. That's what Jesus does. And that's what he calls us to do. He loves his friends in low places. You read the New Testament, you'll find there's some people in high places, especially religious authority. He had some issues with them. We, we could talk about those things another time. I've always preached that then after Jesus was baptized, that the Holy Spirit came down. If you ever wonder why we believe in a trinity, the word trinity isn't in the Bible, but you've got Jesus, who is God. You've got the Father who's about to speak, and you've got a dove that descends, representing the Holy Spirit. Jesus said that we should baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I don't fully understand it, but I preach it. Someday I'll understand it. I understand a little bit more than that, but I want to focus now on what the Father said. I've always said that the Father affirmed Jesus, and how much more do we need some words of affirmation from Jesus, or from the Father? Couldn't you use God saying something like, you are my son in whom I'm well pleased? Yeah, that, that'd be pretty nice. But most of us would say, well, he wouldn't say that about me. Jesus hadn't performed a miracle. He hadn't. He hadn't preached a sermon. And yet, the Heavenly Father said of, of him, You are my dearly loved Son, and you bring me great joy. So what did Jesus do that brought the Father great joy? He identified with his friends, his brothers and sisters in low places. He got in the water up to here with broken humanity. Think about it. That is what caused the Heavenly Father to have great joy in His Son. And when you immerse yourself, when you say to a friend, I'll go with you, I won't be self-righteous, I don't care about my reputation, whatever the situation, I'll go with you, I will be your friend, I will be your advocate, I will stand with you. Yeah, your Heavenly Father takes great joy in that as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us to get Jesus like he gets us. Help us to understand how he just jumped into our broken world to bring hope and healing. And he wasn't everything that everyone expected him to be then. But he promised that he would return. And when he does, then everything will change. Give us wisdom today. Father, there might be those that are listening that would say, I've never trusted in Christ as my Savior. Today is the day that you can do that. And sometimes we get confused between Jesus' first coming and second. He's both. 
He's the lion of the tribe of Judah, but he looks like the lamb that was slain according to the book of Revelation. He's the one who has the gentle heart that we can come to any time. And yet he's the king of kings and lord of lords. And he will reign on his throne forever and ever. Wise are we if we choose to bend the knee now. Bless every person who hears this today. I pray it in your name. Amen. I'll be back in just a few minutes. A thousand times I fail, still your mercy remains. And should I stumble again, still I'm caught in your grace. Everlasting, your light will shine.
I give you control Consume me from the inside out, Lord Let justice and praise become my embrace To love you from the inside Thank you again for joining us today. And just in closing, when I think of how we can bring our Heavenly Father great joy, it is by identifying, it is by helping our friends in low places. And I, I think of the letter that I got. Just somebody, even though people were telling her, don't go out, it's not safe. This was over three months ago. She's fine, her son's fine. They prayed, they did the right thing. They helped somebody who really needed it. And I don't think that person will ever forget it. Let's purpose to allow God to use us to touch all sorts of people, especially those in low places. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.